Hello, my name is David Tizard, Asia Society contributor and a lecturer in Korean studies here at Seoul Women's University. South Korea has a new president-elect. Yoon suk yeol will be assuming office in May this year. This short video will help give you an understanding of how that all took place. On March 9th, South Korea observed a national holiday as people went to the polls to vote for their next president. It was an incredibly tight race and nobody was quite sure who was going to win. The ruling Democratic Party of Korea had put forward Lee Jae-myung. The conservative opposition had their hopes on Yoon suk yeol When the first exit polls came out once voting was closed, different broadcasters announced different winners. Citizens, therefore, stayed up late into the night and even early into Thursday morning waiting to see who the next president would be. Eventually, the conservative opposition candidate, Yoon suk yeol was announced as the winner. The Democratic Party candidate, Lee Jae-myung, then conceded defeat and the race was over. The margin of victory was only 0.7%, making it the closest presidential race in South Korean history. South Korea does have, however, a history of very tight presidential races. In 1997, Kim Dae-jung won by less than 400,000 votes. This closeness has characterized a lot of Korean elections since democracy was enacted here. However, this latest campaign was characterized by mudslinging. President-elect Yoon suk yeol has therefore declared that national unity and bringing people together will be one of his first objectives. What South Korean people can be congratulated on is their voter turnout. It didn't quite hit the 80% mark that some people were predicting. However, at just over 77% of the citizens of South Korea voting in this latest presidential election, the country should be once more proud of its democratic institutions, its citizens, and its approach to democracy. Despite the difficulties presented by the COVID-19 pandemic and surging numbers of Omicron cases, early voting the national holiday, automatic registration, and polling places located across the city. This was not so much a culture that made the huge voting turnout, but rather the implementation of various systems that make it easy for people. Let's have a look at the actual results. So we know that Yoon suk yeol was the eventual victor. However, when we break it down, we can look at various categories, such as gender, age, and region. When we look at the voting turnout of people in their 20s, we can see that gender was a deciding factor. Yoon suk yeol dominated the young male vote. Lee Jae-myung, on the other hand, won more of the female vote. A lot of this was driven by statements given in the lead up to the presidential election in which Yoon suk yeol said that he would abolish the Ministry of Gender and Equality. This in one of the OECD's already most unequal countries in terms of gender. However, when we look at people in their 30s, we can see that trend is not quite so evident. Nearly 45% of women in their 30s turned out and voted for Yoon suk yeol When we look away from gender, and more at age, we can see that the Democratic Party candidate Lee Jae-myung won the majority of the votes of people in their 40s irrespective of their gender. However, when we look at people 60 and above, we can see that the Conservative candidate Yoon suk yeol had the majority of these votes. This represents a generation gap and shows how South Korea's history of authoritarianism and Cold War politics plays into how people go to the voting stations. But it wasn't just age and gender. Region also played a decisive role in this election. Some analysts have suggested that regionalism in South Korean politics is not quite the force that it once was. A look at the voting patterns, however, suggests that it shouldn't be discounted that quickly. There is still a strong, east-west divide. Lee Jae-myung dominated the more liberal southwest corner of the Korean peninsula, and likewise, Yoon suk yeol did the same in the conservative stronghold of the southeast.
At some points, these votes were reaching up to a nine to one ratio, showing that sometimes in South Korea, where you live decides who you vote for as much as the candidates or their policies themselves. Looking more specifically at the capital of South Korea, Seoul, we can see that Yoon suk yeol dominated much of this, particularly the central areas. This is where the housing prices are the highest. The further we move out from the center, we can see Lee Jae-myung's support growing there. Real estate prices have been a huge problem in South Korea, going back now nearly a decade, if not more. And this will be one of the challenges for the new president to try to address. In the build up to this presidential election, there were four main candidates all taking part in debates and campaigning. And Chul Su was the third main candidate, and he represented a center-right position, with his policies focusing on science and the implementation of technocrats to push South Korea forward. In the past, An Chul Su has sided with both Democratic and Conservative parties in previous elections. This time, shortly after the last poll was announced, An Chul Su announced that he would be siding with the conservative candidate Yoon Sok Yeol. In doing so, he hoped to bring his support with him and bring about a change in government in South Korea. With the polling and the election race so close, we can see that An's support of the conservative candidate may have done enough just to push Yoon over that line. Shim Sang Jung came in third in the eventual race. She was the fourth candidate running and present in the television debates. In the final results, she received about 2.3% of the final total, around 800,000 votes. During these debates, Shim was the only candidate to address the issues of gay rights and anti-discrimination laws which would protect the vulnerable members of society. While many congratulated her, including President-elect Yoon suk yeol for giving voice to these issues, she suddenly didn't perform as well as she did five years ago, where she recorded 2 million votes and nearly 6% of the total. So, with President-elect Yoon suk yeol set to take office on May the 10th, we need to wonder what will change in South Korea. Certainly, Yoon will have to deal with the COVID pandemic, as well as the tiredness that is being experienced by many South Korean citizens after two years of various restrictions upon their livelihood. Yoon has also promised that he will move the presidential office from Cheongwadae to the government complex in Gwangamun, Seoul. He has pledged that his administration will do more to address the public through various debates and make himself more present. Yoon's election could also have profound impacts on South Korea's foreign policy. Yoon has promised to be tougher on China and North Korea, and instead focus more on its democratic allies, the United States and Japan. For many foreign and domestic observers, one of the things that characterizes South Korea's presidential elections, as well as the high voter turnout and the huge interest in democracy, are the memes and jokes that spread across the national broadcasters on election night. These are generally 3D animations used with the main candidates' faces in order to promote a little bit of fun. This year, we had the pleasure of seeing Yoon suk yeol and Lee Jae-myung dancing to Esper songs and BTS. We saw them in Mad Max-style operations as well as Olympic skaters. So, what questions do we need to ask ourselves in light of this latest South Korean presidential election? First of all, we might address whether the conservative opposition won this election or the ruling Democratic Party lost it. President Moon's support rate still remains relatively high. Traditionally, South Korean presidents with one single five-year term enter a lame duck period and their support rate drops quite low. However, President Moon has still managed to retain a lot of his initial support. However, his administration has faced various controversies and scandals over the last two years, and it might be said that people simply wanted change rather than voting for the Conservative Party. 
In South Korea this week, many people will be celebrating the victory of their preferred candidate in the latest presidential election. Conversely, some people will be commiserating and reflecting on why their candidate didn't win the Blue House. However, what seems to be the case is that the real winners were, once more, South Korea's democratic institutions and the people of South Korea themselves. They came out in nearly record numbers, 77% to choose their next president. They did this despite difficult conditions, and yet because of the approach to democracy and the system set up, they were all able to participate. I've been David Tizard, and thank you for watching this quick recap on the recent South Korean presidential election. Goodbye.